testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servants, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is God's Word. As we turn now to the New Testament, this will also serve as the basis for our our sermon of unmatched. From 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before Him. It is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is God's Word. We stand to sing the the gospel verse. We preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block and foolishness to the rest of the world. Now, I know that most of you do not think that your faith is foolish at all. No, it makes perfectly good sense that God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son into death. It is the cross that we hold sacred, and it is the centerpiece of our faith the crucified and resurrected Jesus for the sins of the world. But how does the rest of the world view it? How do the philosophers of this age and those who consider themselves to be extremely wise? Well, let's take a look. How do they view the cross? Well, when we asked the first person, uh, Richard Dawkins, he wrote the book called The God Delusion. And specifically of this doctrine, he wrote that it's a horrible idea that God, this paragon of wisdom, couldn't think of a better way to forgive us our sins than to come down to earth as His alter ego as His Son and have Himself hideously tortured. What about uh, Christopher Hitchens? This is from a YouTube video. The teachings of Christianity are immoral, and the most immoral of them all is the essential teaching of the vicarious atonement on which you can throw your sins onto somebody else. He wrote the book, God is Not Great. And finally, Sam Harris. He wrote, Christianity amounts to the claim that we must love and be loved by a God who approves of scapegoating, torture, and the murder of one man, his son. They don't just disagree with the cross. They are offended by it. They hate it. And... You know, we can just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, you know, so what? You know, that's their opinion. We have ours. I suppose we could agree to disagree. Unfortunately, we cannot so easily dismiss them as irrelevant and unbelievers. Now, I know that these particular men do not run the country. They don't enact laws or make our policies. 
they, they certainly don't um, oversee our ethics for the medical and, and hospitals of what they do there, and they're not the ones who give permissions for this book to be taught in school, but not this one. To be honest, these particular men have real no impact on your day-to-day life, but their ideas do. For theirs is the prevailing wisdom that says in our culture, if you want to know what's really true and right and accurate, it must be scientifically proven, which means that this wisdom is above all other wisdoms and knowledge, making scientists and researchers the true holders and keepers of wisdom. Okay, but let me ask, what does and what wisdom does a biologist have and what has she gleaned in her research that has informed her about the nature of God and His work? As she observes plant life and animal life, what has she discerned that a God has or has not? Can she verify or deny that a God has sent His only Son into the world to die for the sins of that world? I mean, isn't it scientifically true that she can only speak with authority that which she can test and observe with her eyes? so that the unseen reality of God takes a very different discipline and area of study, right? Oh, it's not that biology is bad. It's it's extremely helpful in its area, along with mathematics and and cosmology, anthropology, even, um, you know, chemistry. All of this has its place. But when you think of what um, Stephen Hawking has to say, about gravity and the earth, when you, when you consider that he declares that the entire universe was created by gravity and not by God, he may very well be the person to go to, to be informed about the nature of gravity. But how can he speak with authority and with certainty about a deity that he has never met or studied? In fact, by his own admission, he says, I've never met a God. And yet, there he proclaims, so how then can this meet any level of standard for scientific evidence of just that I've never met one, so there must not be one? Because a lot of our scientific assumptions are based upon things we've never directly observed. Take dark matter. Scientists assume that it's out there. It has to be. But we can only assume that by its effects, not by direct observation. And yet, the scientists and the prevailing wisdom of our day doubles down on wisdom and says, no, this is what we must follow. This, by knowing things in our universe, we will finally solve the real problems that you and I face by having the right economic systems, political theories, educational, uh, scientific, everything will come together and finally solve all of our problems. In fact, Christianity... The Bible and God, it's just a foolishness that gets in the way of actually knowing the real facts. And you know who agrees? St. Paul says that yes, the cross is a stumbling block. It is in the way, but not in the way that you have said or complained about. For the cross is a stumbling block because it proclaims that the real problem with humanity isn't a lack of wisdom, but it is our wicked hearts. And that nothing less than the death of the innocent Son of God will set it aright. Now, you and I are people that like evidence, right? We want some, Give me some proof on that. So just consider for a moment uh, the, the horrible tragedy of the school shooting down in Florida. Anytime such violence happens, especially in our schools, what's, what's the thing that we really want to know? And we want, we want some answers to two very important questions. Who did it? And why did he do it? And it's usually he, isn't it? Okay. And then, and then after we've learned uh, the, those two facts, then what's the mantra that typically follows? Let it never happen 
again. As if somehow by, by knowing that we will then have enough knowledge so that it won't happen in the future. But even if we knew absolutely everything that goes on in the mind of a person who would consider such violence, and we knew what led up to it, and we even could know how to prevent it, even if we had the wisdom to know how to enact and enforce the proper laws, had the proper personnel and staff posted and in positions ready and and waiting for whatever, the chances of another school tragedy are 100% guaranteed to happen again. Now, how can I be so sure of that? Because our hearts are wicked. Somewhere else out in the country, another baby boy has been born into a family that had other concerns of loving him and raising him in a way that is good and right. And this scarred soul that has been born sinful like the rest of us then will go to a school. And absolutely every school in the United States and in the world is exactly the same in this aspect, that there will always be a group of people who are esteemed and respected and loved and another group that is despised and even hated. And then... Every one of us, from parents to teachers to principals, administrators, fellow classmates, neighbors, and grandparents, we all will continue as we have to this very day to be too inwardly focused with our own lives to care for absolutely every bruised soul among us. You see, there is a seed of wickedness in each one of us, and when the conditions are just right, it begins to grow a little more and a little more. And sometimes it grows enormously big, and it's horrendous, and sometimes it's just something snarky on Facebook you posted. But it's still a wickedness inside of us. We need something more than than wisdom. We need something unmatched in its power and truth that can deal with our wicked hearts. But before St. Paul gets to the answer, he says, but there's one more group, and they too are completely offended by the cross. Now, this group of people, they aren't really into wisdom or the elites. In fact, they're kind of cynical of the the intellectuals who say, we have a plan to save the world. For this group of people, they're pretty simple in the way they explain how things are in the world. For this group, they say, you know what? There's two kinds of people in the world. There are good people, and there are bad people. And how, how society will get fixed from its ills is to be good and to find the bad people and make them pay, lock them up. For this group of people, it's very important then to be a very good dad, teacher, police officer, to do your job, to work hard, because if you don't, we're going to call you to account and we're going to make you responsible because, because being good is how we're going to fix the problems of this society. See, even this group is offended by the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus, and here's why. Because the cross of Jesus says that the good people and the bad people are exactly alike before God in the heart. And that's offensive, right? Well, you're, you're saying, wait a minute, so the, 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 fam, the spouse who has been completely faithful all through their marriage is the same as that scoundrel who's been cheating on his wife with, with several different women. The, the, the person who has given their life, he or she, in that thin blue line of the police force to serve and protect and has been very diligent and sacrificial in their work is the same as the people they're trying to apprehend who have not had an honest day in their life, have always been trying to work something. They're all the same. The crucified Jesus declares that you and the shooter in Florida, that you and the men who have recently been convicted of child pornography, it's been in the news like ad nauseum, and and you and the women who embezzled the Cheney Sentinel are all the same. That's offensive to our sensibilities, right? It's like, well, there should be some... Some, some variations there in that grade, you know, but all the same? And, and see, the cross of Jesus offends everybody. 
those on the left who are liberal, those who are on the right who are conservative, those who love guns and those who hate them, the intellectual elites and the common man. It says that your wisdom is lacking and your goodness is inadequate. Nothing less than the death of Jesus at the cross will set the heart aright. And unless you stumble over the cross, unless it offends you on a routine basis throughout your life, then unless it's there, then something else then is your wisdom that you're living by. You know, maybe you do trust scientific truth as the way things really are. Some other goodness is in your life. And maybe, you know, you believe, well, yeah, I am a pretty good person, and there are bad people, and we should get the bad people into jail. See, unless the cross of Jesus is the center and the foundation of how you look at yourself and you look at the world, then something else is. But here's, here's how a Christian thinks about himself or herself. And it goes to the very heart and the root of the problem, a wickedness of our heart and, and the bruised and the deficit that we have inside of us. This is how a Christian talks to himself or herself. They say that I am worthy of being loved by you, God. I am worthy of belonging to your family because you, Jesus, Make me so by your cross. What you did there makes me enough here. I am worthy of being loved because you have redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature with a wicked heart. It's you, Jesus, your grace, your cross, your resurrection. It's you that I boast in and I glory in. You see, for a Christian, somebody who follows Jesus, they not only stumble over the cross, they boast in it. And what? Every, I thought boasting was bad, you know. But, but Paul says, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And think about why you boast. Well, why, why do you boast? It's because this, whatever it is, makes me a great person, special, important. It justifies my existence because of this. And the only thing that can really handle and have the full strength and the power to be boasted in that's not too fragile is the cross of Jesus. I mean, think about it. If you, if you boast in your looks, you know, if that's where you really feel good about yourself or you think you would feel good about yourself if you're just a little more attractive, it's too fragile because every year you get one year older one year older, and it fades. If your job, if your accomplishments in, in civic affairs is where you finally, this is where I matter, this is where I'm important, I'm justified, my life right here, even that is too fragile. Because, well, that's what you did 10 years ago. What have you done today? Oh, the people over there are doing even greater things. If it's even your family, your church family, or your country. It's all too fragile because we are certainly not the same country we used to be 30 years ago. We're certainly not the same church body in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod we were 50 years ago. The only thing that is unmatched, unchanging, unending is Jesus, Him crucified and resurrected. And so we boast in Him. And to help you in that, I've got it right here, to help you in that this week, I have a sermon take home. And I invite you to put it up somewhere where you can see it. Because you are followers of Jesus. You are Christians. And this is why Christians think about themselves. I am, I am worthy of being loved. I am worthy of belonging to God's family because of you, Jesus. What you've done for me on the cross. It goes to the heart of who we really are. I invite you to take that home and to live it this week in this unmatched faith. Amen. I invite you to stand then as we confess our faith.